Now to introduce HAP, during my seven decades or so, I've been happy to say that I have done some paddling uh, on our local rivers, the Saugeen and the Beaver and the Rankin and the lakes, Bells Lake, Williams Lake, uh, out to Cranberry Island and out to Franklin Island near Perry Sound. Uh, my mother was born in Hearst. My father was born, was uh, raised in Pembroke. And he told me that he paddled the Mattawa and the Ottawa rivers. And he also worked as a lumberjack in the wintertime at near Cobalt. And he was probably helping to harvest old growth for us. I don't know, never heard. So what a treat it has been for me to invite Hap Wilson here by the beautiful Gitsunama Wikwadong, which is the original name of this area of Great Sturgeon Bay, the original name of Owen Sound from the First Nations, as we're by the shores here. And to meet with all of us here as we celebrate Earth Week and the many little steps and big steps that we humans can, do, can take to help Mother Nature by carefully lending a hand, and in many cases, to get out of her way so she can do the job without our interference. About seven years ago, I had been seeing several intriguing references to Grey Owl, and I didn't know much about him at all. And so I um, endeavored to find and read all the Grey Owl books I could find. And one of those wasn't by Grey Owl, it was by Hap. It was called Grey Owl and Me. And that introduced me to his writing and his artwork. And it's just fabulous. So when I had a chance to invite Hap to, to join us today, I, I made a point of trying to read all of Hap's books I could read. And they're just so eloquent. He's, he's an artist and he paints portraits with his writing. So please you know, buy them all up, <laughs> you know, it's just great. So, um, and, and but he also pointed out how Grey Owl uh, became a writer. He was encouraged by his uh, Métis uh, wife and that, that he should use that uh, conservation as a goal. Uh, and so he did that. He, he became a, a writer, he got better at it. And then he became a speaker all across North America and Britain to, and which had the result of saving the beaver population that was being annihilated by the, the, fur, the fur trade. So he was really an environmental crusader right there. Um, so that's a little over about 100 years ago. And uh, more, uh, so that was that part. So. In, in again, in reading uh, Hap's books about his own experiences and getting hooked on canoeing on the Mattawa. And uh, there are even references in, in Hap's books to our own Tom Thompson, who grew up here, and be, but then paddled and, and did his artwork based on uh, the Northern country primarily. So, but he, even in Tom Thompson's uh, uh, works, he depicted not only the beauty and power of nature, but also some of the wastelands left by the de deforestation of many of the woodlands in Ontario. So he was a crusader too, uh, showing the, the good things and the not so good things. In 2017, when Owen Sound featured many activities commemorating Tom Thompson uh, 100 years after he had died and wrapping him in a warm embrace, including a wake for Tom at the Leeds Cemetery that year, the Owen Sound field naturalists also offered a presentation about Tom Thompson, the naturalist and artist with Angie Littlefield. I distinctly remember at that time seeing references to Tom Thompson, uh, the, <clears throat> the paddler and artist, uh, and his friend Grey Owl, the paddler and writer, meeting together on more than one occasion here in Ontario and also in Banff. So I think it is really very appropriate to complete the circle and that, and that the Owen Sound community represented here today offer a warm welcome and embrace to Hap Wilson, the paddler, the artist and the writer as we celebrate Earth Week here today. I just want everybody to know that that's me carrying that 85 pound canoe in the mountain. It's an old town. <laughs> Maybe yes. And yes, we still carry, well, my wife carries. <laughs> <laughs> 
the heavy canoes <laughs> still. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the mayor and the uh, lovely city of, of Owen Sound. It's been 20 years since I uh, spoke here and uh, uh, or near here somewhere. Um, and uh, and thank you for the uh, the Field Naturalist Club for the in invitation. And uh, and this is this is so great because as the mayor mentioned, you know, I've been in my pajamas for two years now. Get your picture. Oh my picture. Oh, that's important. Yes, you got the, my, my picture on the screen. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, it, this is so different. It's nice to see. And, and as, a, as a writer speaker, it's so nice to have faces in an audience and not a screen, looking into a screen. And it's so impersonal doing all of this Zoom stuff. And I'm, I'm not tech savvy. Um, and thank goodness that we did have Brian. Thank you for setting this up for me and Willie. And uh, and I'd just like to introduce my wife in the front seat here. She's way more interesting than I am. And if you have any questions about uh, <laughs> anything that we uh, that we do, um, please uh, please uh, engage in a conversation with her. You'll find her, like I say, way more interesting. Uh, interesting to note that has anybody heard the peepers yet? Uh, What's well, funny because I, I did bump into a hiker from Owen Sound the other day, and <clears throat> he was trying to cross this swamp. And he didn't know whether to go across the swamp or go around. So I said, well, just listen. He said, and he, and he stood there at the edge of the swamp and he listened. And he said, and you could hear, it's too deep, it's too deep, it's too deep. <laughs> and the bullfrogs were saying, go around, go around, go around. So <clears throat> anyway, that's my own sound joke, <laughs> my own sound joke really. Um, there's a, so much to talk about and uh, in such a short time. And I, um, I'm gonna start off with a, with a short video um, that our daughter put together for us because we're not, like I said, we're not tech savvy. And uh, that, uh, uh, it's just a fun video. It really portrays what my wife and I do. This is a, a mapping expedition that we did, what, three, four years ago up on the North Seal River, north of, of uh, um, north of Thompson uh, in northern Manitoba near the Nunavut border at the time when the Sayasidani people, First Nations, were initiating a, a first, first of its kind in Canada, a tribal park where they have the, uh, the complete management and uh, um, control over their traditional lands. It's an interesting story too, as I, I may make mention of it in my River of Fire book. And, uh, We'll do the video and then we'll get back to the, uh, the talk. I hope this is my main computer died a couple of days ago and I had to scramble and put download new new um, PowerPoint um, stuff on my computer here. So uh, it might be a little bit scrambled, but bear with me. I think it's all gonna work out in the end.
break there. That was Joe Mendelson. I don't know if ever. favorite places in Canada to travel and explore. It's just called Esker country. And I'm not sure if anybody else has been up in, into Northern Manitoba. Anybody in the audience here? Uh -huh. A few people. Uh, these eskers are glacial formations that uh, snake their way through and across the, uh, the upper shield area. And it was a travel way for the, the Dene people. Dene people weren't paddlers. They weren't necessarily paddlers, but they did have caribou crossings and they would, they would cross in their small <clears throat> homemade boats. And, uh, and, that's, and they would use these eskers for travel. For travel. Um, with this show, I'm hoping my presentation doesn't sound vainglorious or self-serving. That's important to me. The outdoor world and exploration are evolving. Uh, there's been a diversion from historic norms and purposes where self-seekers are driven by social media hits and YouTube followers. Um, Wade Davis is, a, is an associate explorer, um, a member of the Explorers Club, one of the best and known international anthropologists and explorers. Wade Davis uh, mentions that uh, he's actually a, a true Indiana, uh, Indiana Jones in Canada. Um, he said that there is nothing more boring than travel books focused on the self. It's similar to false heroics in the realm of exploration. 
As a writer, you're just a conduit for the voices of the people. This, this is so true today <clears throat> when we've divorced ourselves so far from nature and distance ourselves from the true meaning of, 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 of our relationship with the First Nations of the country. I am fortunate to have been a part of a Canadian movement focused on the protection of wild places and an appreciation for the cultural importance of Aboriginal trails. I am not alone. My stories do not revolve around me, but circumnavigate the sublime association with the land and of other individuals whose actions and passion are similar to my own. <clears throat> Interestingly, how many rivers do you think there are in Canada? Named rivers. How many? Well, that's a, yeah, not quite 30,000. 8,500 named rivers in Canada. And I've paddled 1% of those rivers. That's a, lifetime, that's a lifetime of paddling. So <laughs> I've got a long way to go to, to, to uh, and it's funny because people come up to me and they say, have you paddled this river? Have you paddled that river? I said, do you know how many rivers there are in Canada? There's 8,500 rivers. You know, certainly there are some bucket uh, list trips that, uh, and, I, and my wife and I have traveled outside the country and on rivers and in and, and places that I won't even get to uh, in, this, in this program. Um, Canada is one of a handful of countries with an appreciable amount of wilderness and it's quickly disappearing. As a national amenity, wilderness and its network of rivers becomes more valuable as it becomes scarce. Oliver Wendell Holmes, I'm sure everybody's heard that name before, um, once said that a river is more than an amenity. It is a treasure. It offers a necessity of life that must be rationed among those who have power over it. You could look at a river as the driving force of nature. As a metaphor, I know for my wife and I, and certainly for many others, it is the flow of life itself. So looking at Ontario, um, this is the general area um, that I, <clears throat> I have in the past and my wife and I have, have mapped out in the province. And uh, it's a fairly substantial area. And each guidebook that I've, I've done, not necessarily to make life easier for the, for the, for the pad recreational paddler, there was always an environmental motive for putting these these books together and uh, focusing on endangered spaces, endangered rivers, especially the watersheds, very important. How many people have paddled in Tomogamy? A lot of, a, a fair number of people. Tomogamy is known for what? Anybody give me an idea? It's known for many things. Yes, just yell it out. Yes, red pine, especially at Wolf Lake. Yeah. Yes, it's one of the last remaining uh, ancient forests, old growth pine forests uh, in North America. Some of the trees, three, 400 years old. I know at our, we have an eco lodge that we, we spend five minutes in off grid eco lodge up in Tomogamy on the Lady Ellen River. And we have hiking trails through the old growth forest. These trees are three, 400 years uh, old and they're magnificent. And uh, we've been fighting. We're, we continue to fight for the protection of both the red and white pine stands uh, across not just Tomogamy, um, but across the province. Um, interestingly, when I was a, a paddler in Tomogamy for the first several years, I had traveled most of the canoe route. I, had, I knew nothing about old growth forests. This is back in the 70s. I knew nothing about First Nations that I didn't know that much about it, even though um, in my upbringing, my father used to make survival films for the Department of Lands and Forest in the 1950s. And I know it's hard to believe that I was, that I'm that old, but um, <laughs> I was born in 51. We had a cottage near Peterborough and my father worked with the uh, uh, Curve Lake uh, First Nations. And, and, and there was this one fellow, Charlie, um, a big man to me as a six-year-old, he was a big man dressed in a lumberjack shirt, green, green pant, work pants, didn't say much, um, mostly hand gestures. He smelled of wood smoke and rawhide and taught me my, my first canoe lessons orient, orienteering in the bush without, without a compass, 
all of the, you know, how to boil water in a birch bark bowl, that kind of thing. So I saw this all as magic. And I took that, I wanted to be a native person so badly. And, uh, and I knew at an early age that I was not corporate material. So I had to find something else that was more suited to my, I think my passions. Getting back to the map here, um, I was hired by the natural resources because I went in and complained that I said, we're losing our canoes here um, from the logging interests. And, and I gave them this on the right hand side, you see Tomogamy canoe roots as the uh, really the focus of that particular network of lakes and rivers that, that formed the, the wilderness area of Tomogamy. On the left, you can see Nadaki Manan. Now, has anybody heard that name before? Know, know what that is? That's the traditional territory of the Temiagam and Anishinaabe people. And I learned several years later that, that what I had mapped out for the government to, to try to have some kind of protection status for these, these roots, not just for the wilderness values, but for the Nostogon and, and the fact that these roots are 5,000 years old and it's the, it's the largest intact Aboriginal trail system in the world, still, still being used. And that, that means a lot, that makes it extremely important. But working as a ministry employee, as a park ranger, I soon found out that there were a lot of things wrong with the way we manage the resources. It doesn't matter if it's, if, if it's timber resources, mining, fisheries, game, <clears throat> you name it. There were, there were a lot of um, problems in the system. One of the problems was the fact that we had a sensitive features report that had all of the, the archaeology, all of the ANSI sites, everything was, was in these three large books. So we knew where a lot of that was, but we had a, we had a district um, ar archaeologist who was doing work um, compiling this information. He was fired um, after he was finding too many archaeological sites, burial sites, uh, tooling sites, and he, his uh, term was, uh, he was terminated primarily because they didn't want that much information that might spoil the logging interests in, within the Tomogamy District. So only 10% of that area that you see in front of you has been actually surveyed for archeological sites. Yet, you know, business goes on as usual. Um, I'm you know, not trying to get too political here. <laughs> I know it's hard for me. <laughs> um, in comparison, Algonquin Park, I've just superimposed Algonquin Park on top of the, uh, the Tomogamy Wilderness Area. So you can see it's comparable in the, in the, in the size. I mentioned what's so special about tomogamy. And you mentioned the red pine trees, the white pine trees. And this, this ancient forest was particularly important to the First Nations people, the Temiag Anishinaabe people. Uh, it was life-giving, life-sustaining. And we don't know enough about um, how, to, how to propagate old growth forests. We were intent on cutting it down and then worrying about it later. And tomogamy, for example, is uh, um, it, the geology of tomogamy. It's a rock knob upland, so the, thin, the soils are very thin. I remember working with the uh, Nature of Things, David Suzuki's crew back in the 1980s doing a tomogamy feature. And they went out by helicopter to land where um, they, the year before they had planted seedlings. When they landed there, the, <clears throat> the, there was no soil left, but they could still see the seedlings laying on top of the rock. And all of the soil had been washed away since it had been clear cut. Just things like this um, was fairly common um, up in Tomogamy. And I'm just talking about Tomogamy. This is going on across the country, this, this type of uh, um, logging practices. The big pine, again, uh, one of the hallmark features <clears throat> Certainly for cultural tourism, adventure tourism, ecotourism, it's a, it's a huge draw, not just in Tomogamy, but other places in Quebec, um, even in Muskoka. Maple Mountain, anybody been up Maple Mountain? Anybody who goes to Tomogamy usually heads for Maple Mountain, right? Uh, Chibeji, place where the soul spirit dwells. It kicked off the environment movement in 1972, the same year, Greenpeace got started out in the West Coast and uh, uh, co-founded by uh, uh, the late uh, Bob Hunter. I don't know if you remember the name Bob Hunter, co-founder of Greenpeace. He was the morning guy at City TV for years. 
Uh, we did a lot of videos together across Canada when he was working for City TV. Uh, one of our trips um, certainly was up Maple Mountain, climbed the tower. He wanted to get to the top. And I remember um, standing at the top of the top of the tower when we were filming and everybody's names described on the wood panels inside and it, the tower is shaking. I slept up there twice it's, and I don't recommend it to anybody. And it, you always think in the middle of the night that the tower is going to come down. We looked at the, one of the panels and there was something described in there which, which has haunted me ever since. And it said, have you outlived your soul? And I'm trying to think that's not the usual graffiti somebody puts on <laughs> in a place like that. I have to think about what that means. Maybe somebody can explain that to me later. Anyway, to Beijing, 1972-73, the Ontario government wanted to build a, an international ski hill. Did anybody hear about this? Does anybody remember that? Not too many. Um, promising jobs and, 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 and local security. Uh, and, uh, you know, the tallest, taller than Blue Mountain, it'd be a thousand foot vertical drop and uh, it would bring all kinds of tourism in. What did they forget to include in that, um, that proposal was the fact that Beijing is a sacred place for the Temelag Anishinaabe. It has been for uh, thousands of years. And it was a burial site uh, for, they would take, and also a vision quest site, very important vision quest site. Um, if you look at the mysticism and the uh, mythology of First Nations, um, the more you travel, the more you learn about First Nations, the, the more you, you knew that you didn't know about it. Um, 10 people have died on that mountain um, for whatever reasons, whether it's, it's just coincidence, um, a helicopter crash, um, one of the in initial fire tower rangers drowned in the lake, plane crash. Um, so you wonder what's going on with the energy of this place. Are we, you know, are we not treating it the way it should be? Um, certainly, the only really good thing that happened out of that proposal was the fact that it kicked off a really powerful environment movement in central Canada. Um, but it gets downplayed because, be, certainly, because Greenpeace had started at the same time on the West Coast. Everybody, you know, this is when they were out trying to stop the uh, the nuclear blasting. Uh, initially, and, and then save the whales, and and then went on to you know save the the, the ancient forest on the west coast. Um, interesting to note that at the same time, it was all happening right here in Tomogamy. That was uh, um, that was a big thing at the time. Also known as deep water, Tomogamy means deep water by the shore, deep lakes, clear water lakes, not just the pine, but the uh, the conglomeration of lakes and the mix of, of lakes and, and rivers. When you look at some of the maps, um, we have a tendency to anglicize a lot of the Ojibwe names. And this has happened in Tomogamy and other places in, in Canada. When we can't pronounce, either we can't pronounce the Ojibwe name or the Cree name. So we change it, you know, we name rivers and lakes after governor general's daughters or cousins or, you know, somebody in the government, you know, wants to name a river after their wife. Tomogamy is, is no different. There's Lady Evelyn, there's Lady Sydney, Lady Dufferin. And I mean, there's other stories uh, that there was an old logging camp on Lady Dufferin that housed a lot of the uh, upper crust from the logging companies. And they, they used to bring in um, prostitutes to, uh, um, and they named, <clears throat> that's where the, their favorite uh, ladies were given local names just to thank them for their services. However, there's other really, I think more, um, I think ingrained uh, um, translations. You look at this picture here, this is the, this is the South Channel Lady Evelyn. It, and it, it notes that in an, you know, the Anishinaabe called it Tungedi, and which means asshole pointing backwards because <laughs> it's so shallow this is, you're doing this halfway down the river. So a lot of the names, and it's probably a good thing they didn't, you know, they didn't translate some of the Indian names into, uh, into English. So, but just to say, you know, that, and if you look at a lot of the, a lot of the native names of place, like place names, they tell a story. The language tells a story. And we don't really understand, you know, what, um, what a lot of places, places mean. Um, 
until we find out you know, what, what the story is behind a particular place. This is a story, there's other places, Opipisue, um, where you're walking over rocks, but you can hear the river one, running underneath, the place where the, where the water runs under rocks. So it's kind of an interesting language when you start studying it. Um, another sacred place, one of the most sacred places in Ontario, I don't know if anybody's heard of Chiscon Abacon Sakahagan. I know it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll give a free book if anybody can pronounce that at the end of the show. <laughs> that means place of the huge rock lake. And you can see there's a pillar of rock that stands about 80 feet. Um, there used to be three of these pillars and two of them have fallen down. Um, very sacred place where they used to do um, uh, healing ceremonies. This is uh, a, a native friend um, who lives, he moved off the reserve of Bear Island, lives on, on uh, his own traditional lands, Alex Matthias. Bob Hunter is there with his cameraman from City TV. We're doing a stand-up uh, um, soundbite for a program we were doing on tomogamy. So um, interesting, this book, it's, it's still um, amazingly popular with people, tomogamy book, and that's the, uh, the first copy came out in 1978. We sold out 5,000 copies the first year. Uh, which is amazing for any kind, any guidebook of, of that nature. It's one of the first guidebooks I think ever produced in Canada. Um, the one that you see here is almost sold out on the left-hand side. <clears throat> now that's the newest edition. We're working on the 12th edition. Uh, this winter is going to print next year, a lot, a lot of new routes um, and what have you. Going back as a ranger, this is back in the ranger days, um, after mapping out and producing the first book, they hired me as a park ranger to clean up all the old portage trails that hadn't been cleared since the uh, ranger days, uh, in the 1920s, 1930s. And they didn't want to give me a chainsaw because there, because there was no, you know, back when you talk about exploration, this is long before GPS or satellite phones. So we couldn't, you know, we ran out of toilet paper, we couldn't get on the sat phone and, and you know, can you fly in some toilet paper or beer or something? <clears throat> if you made a mistake, you had to find a way to get out of it. We did have a, a two-way radio, um, but the two-way radio would only work so far because the, the district was so wide. So they were afraid to give us a chainsaw the first two years. So everything we had to do was ax work. Um, and I'll tell you, that <laughs> that's, that is enervating. It's good exercise. The trees are big, as we know. <laughs> the, they're not little trees up there, they're big trees. So. We, I think over the seven years, seven, eight years that I was a ranger, I think we cleared um, probably 40 kilometers of, of portage trails. We didn't wear life jackets back in those days. The old K-Poc filled, anybody remember those old life jackets? You put them on and if you were in the water, they, they'd come up to about here. So they got shoved under the seats. And I remember the kids at the camps on Lake Tomogamy, they'd paddle away with the life jackets on so that the counselors could see that they were, you know, had their safety equipment on. As soon as they got out of sight, they would shove them under the seats and, and not wear them. I got in trouble for posting this on Facebook and they said, that's, you know, making, leaving a good example for people not wearing a life jacket. Well, this is back in the 1970s and nobody wore, wore life jackets because they were deadly back then. So ongoing, this is a clear cut, not that long ago in, in tomogamy. We're always, you know, finding new spots unless you're out there and probe and get off the main roads um, you come across a lot of this. And unfortunately, when um, I was a ranger and I also worked on the, uh, I was a cartographer, I actually worked on the first version of the, of the Wilderness Park, which was about four times larger than what we have. And it, it was compiled from the sensitive features report that I mentioned earlier. And it had about 93% of all the sensitive features, archaeology and tomogamy. So they stripped it down because it took too much of the inventory away from logging camps. And over the years, they've, they've added some conservation reserves, a couple of waterway parks. And uh, so the, the park system that we have now, but they left a lot of donut holes, which they are, are and the, these donut holes are full of prime old growth forest. Um, that was, uh, um, and that, that was caused to, um, I guess, Try to come up with a plan for the you know that that, that working with 
the current government. It's very, been very difficult over the last year. As, as anybody from the, the conservation or environment um, movement knows, or groups know that we've been shackled by the conservative government um, for a lot of reasons, um, and also dismissing the Endangered, Endangered Species Act and making it easier for industry to um, carry out certain projects without without regard for the Endangered Species Act and also rewriting the, uh, the Environmental Assessment Act as well. So um, just remember that when you go to vote this year, um, uh, we, need, we need to be engaged in changing the political landscape as far as the environment goes. So I'll go on to the Missinabi River. Anybody done the Missinabi River? Several people, it's a popular river, it's a heritage river and it's a waterway park. But at the, interesting, my wife and I paddled it. We were mapping out when we were running our outfitting company in Tomogamy way back, back in the day. We, uh, we were paddling Missanabe and we came across, we were having lunch at uh, one of the rapids and, and we saw a search and rescue helicopter come down and drop a team down just below us. And we thought they were just doing maneuvers. So it wasn't until we got to the town of Matice that said, oh, there was a person that had drowned there a week ago. So we actually paddled over a dead body in the rapids, we didn't know. So that kind of sparked, well, and then I started researching and, and, and I, did, I found out that there were an average of two people that died in that river every year for a period of, of, of 10 years. Some, sometimes there were five or six deaths in one year. So I actually went to, um, I said, this would make a good, a good story. So I went to the, uh, um, the coroner's office in Toronto and I went through all the files 500 files, and I isolated 32 deaths, I think, on the Missanabe in the 10 year period. Uh, 17 of those could have been prevented because there were, there were numerous mistakes on the topographical map series. In fact, um, when they were going to put a, there's plans in 1970 to put a hydro dam at Thunderhouse Falls. Anybody remember Missanabe, they'll remember Thunderhouse Falls. Another magical place, very sacred to both the Cree and the, and the Ojibwe nation. They were going to build a power dam there. So arbitrarily, the cartographer in Ottawa marked the portage on the wrong side of the river, where it's almost impossible to get to. Five people died there. Um, and reading through the police reports and third party reports, it was evident that they were going by the topographical maps. And <clears throat> because it said, well, there's the portage. So you have to get to the portage. So anyway, that was uh, um, the Toronto Star thought that was a great story for people to, to know that that. Now, <clears throat> I went down on a solo run just after two Americans had, had perished at Thunderhouse Falls. I found their camera floating um, just above the falls in a pool. And uh, <clears throat> I had, uh, I was writing the book up in Mitch Cotton on the, on the on, I was renting a cabin for the, for the winter, writing <clears throat> my Missanabe book. And the star reporter came up and said, this is a great story. And I had the camera. He said, I'm going to write the family and see if I can publish some of the pictures. So he, so he did. He got permission. And um, this came out the front page of the Toronto Star in 19, uh, 1994. He said he got more letters and phone calls from that article than any other story that he got from people who almost perished at the same place. And uh, so if you know what, five people died at that waterfall. There were many more that came close. Thunderhouse Falls, um, if you've been there, that water can come up almost 30 feet overnight um, in the summer. If, there, if we have two or three inches of rain in the upper um, marshes and it, and it gets like a big sponge and it releases so quickly and it's almost impossible to get down river because if anybody knows the Missanabe below that, it's a big canyon, lots of rapids, uh, very difficult. Anybody been on the, uh, um, the one major Portage is about 600 yards of slop like this around Hell's Gate. I'll jump to the rivers of the upper Ottawa Valley. Um, that was the first guidebook for, it was actually just a Des Moines River guidebook. Has anybody done the Des Moines River here? It's a very popular river. It's a fun river. Um, <clears throat> it's a great practice river for other bigger rivers. There were 500, uh, I was talking to the air service, uh, and if you remember, if you, flew, if you flew in back in the 80s and early 90s and through the 90s, Ron Bowes was the major pilot for the air service. 
And uh, he said, I asked him, how many people are going into the Des Moines? Because it looks like it's, it's, it's tired. He said 500 groups are flown in every year. So that kind of sponsored the rivers of the upper Ottawa Valley. He said, we need, like to, the tomogamy jump back to the mid 1970s. In tomogamy, there was one park. It was the Wild River, Lady Ellen Wild River Park. So people gravitate towards park systems. That's just a natural thing. That's, it's, and it's on a map, so people head there. It was busier in the 1970s than it is today. And that was one of the reasons why I went to the ministry and said, we need, we need to expand the interest for that, just to protect that core area. And that's one of the reasons why, <clears throat> why we produced the Tomogamy book. We did the same for the rivers of the Upper Ottawa. And we've got now the three sisters, the Des Moines, Noir, and Cologne, equal kind of in a lot of the uh, landscape and, and ecology, as well as some of the other rivers, Petawawa, Mattawa is sponsored there, all of the rivers in the upper section. That was uh, another, we like to think that was a fairly um, important success story, just to spread out the traffic more. Because you have to remember, more people are doing this than ever before. They want to get out, they want to do white water, they want to get out and, and relate to nature in some way, but we don't have enough places to go. Des Moines, beautiful river, it's a pool and drop river, beautiful lakes, lots of nice little rapids. Again, uh, pine clad shores, um, uh, great campsites, it's just a formula for a perfect canoe trip. And you get a break from all the rapid running too. It's not just about the adrenaline rush. That's a nice thing about this type of pool and drop river. Manitoba, my first trip, 1994, up on the Seal River, doing a, an article for Men's Journal magazine. And um, you'll see a book then called River of Fire. It was uh, um, during the year of the worst wildfires in Manitoba history. And flew into Tadouli, got to know the people there, got to know the uh, um, the chief and the band, stayed several days, and we're just about to engage in a ceremony with them. But there was a huge fire burning just uh, off the village. They were starting to evacuate the elders and the children, and we didn't get a chance to partake in the ceremony, which included peyote, by the way, because they had. Um, some Navajo healers up, shamans, if you like. They don't like the word shaman. Um, but fires were encroaching from all directions. And uh, Seal, as you can see, the Seal River is right at the top end of the province of Manitoba. This is the, uh, this is the area that, that my wife and I have done a lot of this river section, especially at the upper section on the, on the uh, left of the screen and, uh, uh, or the, sorry, the lower, left part of the screen. And uh, that's through Esker country and um, interesting association with the, uh, certainly with the people, traditional people of Tadouli who were, <clears throat> who were moved from traditional lands to the, uh, the town of Churchill against their will and lived in a shack town made of plywood and scrap metal and, and uh, um, cardboard and it decimated the population until um, the chief said, we got to go back to our traditional lands. So on their own volition, they went back to Tululi at the, uh, near the headwaters of the Seal River and built their own community with no financial help from the Manitoba government at, at all until 20, I think 20 some odd years later. And they moved, <clears throat> they simply moved the band off the tr traditional lands because they were doing a lot of mining and prospecting in mostly prospecting in that area at the time. So there's nothing in a manual or a guidebook or a, you know, a survival manual, not much anyway, about how to deal with, with wildfires. Has anybody been close to a wildfire? There's probably several people we're having, and that's a product of what? Climate change, right? You see more wildfires, especially in the boreal forest, um, intense fires. Dry, you know, dry seasons. Um, this one, <clears throat> this one in particular was 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 extremely large and about the size of, of Prince Edward Island, um, and it you know just vaults the experience to a different level of of care and scrutiny. This was the Tadouli village. You can see the smoke in the background, not that far from the village, only about a kilometer, 
And this was about the day before they started evacuating the, the people. It's interesting exploration, a lot of history. And there's one thing I'd, I'd like to do is to, is to find out what describes, what best identifies a river system or a specific place. Hudson's Bay Company, they're all over the place. They were, you know, this, this particular one was on the Caribou River and right near the Nunavut border. This is what it looked like when it was operating. Is there a date on that? 1931. And that's the same building back in, that would have been uh, in the 2004 or five. The graveyard where some of the, some of the, you know, the local employees were, were buried along as tops of esters. They buried the dead on the tops of these sandy esters. And do you know why? because of the permafrost, the only place that thawed out enough to bury them deep enough so, the, so they wouldn't be dug up by the wolves. Same cross, decades and decades later. <clears throat> it's a, one thing about that climate, the dryness of the climate, it preserves things. Bir birch bark, uh, rolls of birch bark, there's only one place along the Seal River uh, along the tree line of Canada right there where birch trees grew large enough to get birch bark for their small boats to cross at caribou points, crossing points. Archaeology, um, like I mentioned before, Dene people weren't paddlers, they crossed the land and they had way markers set up. This one actually looks like a face if you look at the, uh, <clears throat> and that um, was on the top of that rock. That rock probably weighed about 500 pounds. And how they got it up there is beyond me. Dolmen stones, they're fine globally. Um, Dolomon, it's from the, from the Gaelic, meaning tables, table rock. Um, hard to say whether, you know, aliens put that there like that, balanced on one rock, or, I mean, or did they somehow, you know, this is in the land of little sticks. There's, there's no trees bigger than what you see there. Did they lever that into place? Or was it a glacial drop? Glaciers moved and they re retreated and they dropped rocks precariously over smaller rocks. Pretty interesting. Um, you can say they buried the dead. Sometimes you'll come across old um, burial sites. That's uh, an influence from the Catholic Church. They used to um, use markers to, especially with the, with the young children that died, they'd have a, a little fence around the, the site. I don't know if, if you can see it there. Um, some of the trip, this is actually up on the Thelon. Is this the Thelon here? Yeah, it's the Thelon River. Um, bugs is always, <laughs> it's part of the adventure, right? And part of the food, we are part of the food chain. So things are different, they've done differently up there. You don't get away from the bugs up there, no matter what time of the season. And you can see in behind Andrea's, you know, she's got the, the bug shirt on. In behind that is, uh, um, what's called a Pirani, still sold uh, from uh, Eureka Tents. And it was a lifesaver because it's the land of the midnight sun almost. It doesn't get dark, rarely gets dark, maybe one or two hours. And uh, so we'd spend evenings in there. You know, we'd be drinking our scotch or wine or whatever. And we can enjoy the, the, the everlasting sun going down slowly. Other places in Manitoba. There are 19 rivers in the rivers of Manitoba. Fabulous. We're actually doing this again with the group uh, this summer. Um, some of the best archaeological sites on the planet. On uh, and this is the influence of the Plains Indians, where the Soto Ojibwe is the most western of the Ojibwe nation before it hits the plains. So they did a lot of trading back then. So bison image in <clears throat> Ojibwe territories. It's not that unusual. And I can get into, I mean, a long story about the paint. I mean, we, you know, we can go to Home Depot and buy the best paint or whatever. We get the best paint. We can paint that on our docks or where, wherever, and it's worn out in three or four years, right? Some of these paintings are thousands of years old. What is the secret that keeps them so vivid on these rocks? Anybody tell me? That's a mystery. 
it's not a mystery to the First Nations people. I, when I was in Mitzpahkan, I took, I, I asked one of the elders there, I said, you know, what's the science behind, you know, these paintings? And he laughed at me. He said, it's not science. It's magic. And he was dead serious. I believe him. He said, this is where the Memagwishawak lived, the stone people. They live behind these rocks. That's why these places are sacred to them. They pick these places specifically as teaching sites. This isn't, this isn't rock graffiti. These are teaching sites. And you weren't allowed to go there unless you left it, unless you had specific permission from the healer, shaman. They don't like that word shaman. <clears throat> they are healers of the upright life. They are um, very strict about who goes and, and who approaches these sites. So it's like entering a church and you wouldn't be, you know, <clears throat> yelling and screaming. You'd, 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 you'd be approaching these places with reverence, right? Um, oops, go back one. Not always. People have desecrated many of these sites, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> one of these sites in uh, northern Manitoba on the Grass River at Tra uh, Tramping Lake, another site just like the one on the blood vein that was at Artery Lake. Um, beautiful thousand-year-old, two thousand-year-old paintings on this rock, just beautiful. And then, and then there were two uh, name, English names on uh, blazoned over top of these paintings. And I went to the local, I went to the one the local lodge owner. I said, well, tell me about what's the deal with these guys painting their names over, over these, you know, these pictographs. He said, oh, I got to tell you this. He, they said a month after they did that, both of them died, one in a car accident and one in a mining accident. So, uh, you know, you think, well, is that a coincidence? What's going on with that? So a lot of stuff we don't know, we don't understand. So getting back to the magic, what is what makes that stick to that rock for so long? That's not science. Well, the Memagwishawak, the stone people, they offer the shaman artist their blood to mix with a pigment, maybe a red ochre, which, which was mined and, and traded amongst the, the First Nations. So they would mix that maybe with some egg albumin, like gull eggs or bear geese or something. And then there would be a ceremony. And then they would use a crushed stick, hand, um, to paint these images on these teachings on the rock. <clears throat> and through ceremony and the blood of the men of Wishawak is what adhered to that paint to that rock for, for so many years. Anyone, anybody want to dispute that? <laughs> Hard to believe, but um, what other explanation? They've never really come up with an explanation for that, um, that paint. Muskoka. Um, this is our home in the wintertime. Um, I was asked by the, uh, I actually pitched the story to uh, the, the local uh, um, municipality. I said, we need to protect some of these sites in Muskoka before they disappear, because obviously developers know the value of property in Muskoka, right? There's, the, you can't buy a, even a lot on one of the major lakes unless you have a million dollars. But there are many spots that when I first moved there, there's some great places here for day trips or overnight trips. So I got out and mapped it out. And I was, you know, astonished as to the beauty and the majesty of Muskoka. And, you know, it's, it's near wilderness. I don't, you know, it's hard to use the word wilderness when you have million dollar cottages and, and steamer boats on the, on the big lakes. But there's still places where you won't see anybody. You can camp out on some pretty wild places that start up in Algonquin Park and go all the way to Georgian Bay. Waterfalls galore. Lake Superior to Manitoba. I was asked by the Trans Canada Ontario to map out from Thunder Bay to Manitoba. They said it's only 500 kilometers. Yeah, that's as the crow flies. Turned out to be 1,250 kilometers from <clears throat> from uh, Thunder Bay to um, Manitoba. And we had, to, there was, the criteria was very strict. It had to include, it had to be the quintessential Canadian canoe trip, but also had to connect First Nations. It had to connect all the communities all the way to Atticoken, Ignis, Dryden, Kenora, and all the way to, to Manitoba. So that was pretty difficult. I tried, had to also stay away from logging, mining, anything that was, that would detract from that 
that quintessential root. So, and uh, Andrea and, and I had done, done a lot of that together. Uh, and it was a big project. I think it took, what, six years to do it all together on many different trips. And, but even to initiate a national trail that represented our first trails, which are the canoe route, the portage routes of our you know, First Nations, <clears throat> these were our first highways. These were the first travel ways. These are the first um, trails. And, and just to finally give notice to that, and it, was, and it was only because they knew that they couldn't build a land trail from Thunder Bay to Manitoba. And did you know that that area, that thousand kilometers across there, or 500 kilometers, however you look at it, um, was the second most difficult place for the railroad builders in Canada. What was the worst place, hardest place? Obviously the Rockies. Second hardest was Northwest Ontario with all the rivers, lakes, streams, the swamps. So they came up, well, let's, do a, let's do a water trail. And I said, well, I think it's brilliant. I wasn't a real fan of the Trans-Canada Trail because it, it really was a glorified ATV snowmobile trail. It didn't really honor the true aspect of what a pathway or bush trail or forest trail really is. And I thought, boy, that's this. I mean, I, I jumped at the opportunity to map this out and, and we worked vigorously to, to, to try to make it perfect. And of course, politics, politics did get involved and it just strangled everything. Everybody had an idea where it should go. And I said, this is not the way, this is not the way we work. You know, we work, um, I was working with the First Nations firsthand, talking with the elders. First thing I did was I, I got a vial of water before I put my, my canoe and paddle in. And I took that vial of water to the, to the elder at uh, um, Shoal Lake. I asked permission to, to travel in their, their waterway. And I got to meet with the, I sat with the elders. <clears throat> and then the, uh, the bureaucrats, obviously, who knew way more than I did about dealing with First Nations um, said, okay, we just want you to map this out. We can deal with the First Nations. Okay, so they sent in you know, the, the suits and the briefcases <clears throat> and the First Nations said, we don't want anything to do with this. You know, they, they just said, you know, they enjoyed working. There was two of us, one other fellow that, that um, accompanied me with, with the First Nations from Kenora. And, uh, and it changed the whole concept of the book. So we actually took it away. For, we actually did the book on our own, um, aside from Trans-Canada Trail and had my publisher said, I want that book. So, um, and it's, it's one of the, I think it's one of the finest books that we, we put out. And it has so many good things about uh, the different routes, heart of the continent, um, the, uh, the native history, the cultural aspect of this, of this this, the history, the prehistory is just phenomenal. This is the, the, the various canoe trails broken down from um, the uh, in different names of the trail systems. It's actually not just one route, although some people have done, the, done this route entirely. You can do it either way. It's a lot of, a lot of ups and downs. Um, first trail uh, coming out of Manitoba. Um, these are all hand-drawn maps, by the way. I like the old style cartography and initiating some of my uh, uh, artwork into the map systems. We had to actually, that's, that's uh, Andrea, my wife and daughter who went on a, one of the major trips mapping out a new route through part new route. We had to actually cut the trails with an ax and a, and a saw. We didn't have chainsaw, but we had to mark it out so people after us knew where to, to find it. A lot of work was into mapping. Um, we. We do use GPS in some places, a lot of note taking, um, not always easy. Uh, this is uh, actually, it was interesting going along the international border uh, between Minnesota and Ontario, uh, Minnesota, Lake Superior Provincial Park, beautifully kept, portages were immaculate, campsites were pristine. On the Ontario side of the Pigeon River, um, none of the portages have been maintained ever. Um, very few campsites, the campsites that we found weren't that well maintained. So there's a big difference between what this province puts into backcountry recreation as compared with the United States. 
that was that was a real disappointment. And this, you know, the Pigeon River, the Boundary Waters is a, is a heritage river and is a waterway park. Yet they don't put any kind of care or maintenance into keeping the portages um, in the same kind of condition that they do across the border. Interesting trip though, because we were one day, you know, one minute we're portaging on the American side, an hour later we're portaging on the, on the Canadian side. We didn't have to, you know, we didn't cross, we didn't have border crossing points, no, you know, armed guards or, or, or what have you. Landscape, I'm, probably everybody here has driven through um, Thunder Bay and seen the landscape there. It's, it's uh, pretty much the same. It's, it's dramatic, beautiful, pristine, and with little development. This is, we're looking at the United States on the left side of the screen from the Ontario side. So, I mean, whitewater is fun. It's great. I mean, people want, want to do it more. We even run three whitewater clinics up at our lodge every year, just so people are properly trained, not just in running whitewater, but paddling properly and doing it safely. All season paddling. Um, if you really want to know the environment, you want to get out in all seasons, maybe. <laughs> just not too cold. So one of my favorite writers, Edward Abbey, anybody read the, the Monkey Wrench Gang or Desert Solitaire, um, American Scallywag, um, back in the Earth First days, an American activist from the 1970s during the rise of Earth First in the North American environmental movement. He says, quoting from the Desert Solitaire, I choose to listen to the river for a while, thinking river thoughts before joining in the night and the stars, a romantic notion that I'm sure is shared amongst everyone in this room. The rivers carry great wisdom and whispers its secrets in our hearts. But too, but too often we take them for granted. Industrialization, greed, opportunistic politicians, climate change all have a deleterious effect on the sanctity of our river resource. Ben Franklin once said, anybody know who Ben Franklin was? I thought so. When the well is dry, we know the worth of water. That's so true with any of our resources, isn't it? That as long as we can turn a light switch on and have lights and electricity, then we, we feel secure. In Ontario, our current government has shackled conservation groups by redefining the Environmental Assessment Act and watered down the Protections for Endangered Species Act twice by giving industry carte blanche regardless of ecological concerns. So we need to change the provincial environmental political landscape and demand more transparency. We need more parks. That's a huge issue right now because more and more people are going out there. Prices are going up. That's an unfair um, system um, that uh, it needs revamping. We need better resource management on all fronts. And importantly, we need to learn from and respect our First Nations and be inclusive of how we manage rivers. Thank you all. That's the end of my my talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any burning questions there. Yes, ma'am. You have to speak up because my hearing is really bad. When you said you went to the, the uh, you had the, the people to go to want to go to the and you took a glass of water. Why did you take a glass of water? Oh, just it's just some mostly just symbolic. I took it from the Falcon River was the first day of, of the trip th that I started the project with, with Trans Canada Trail. We do that very, fairly often with, we ask permission when we do expeditions in that. Like for example, we'll do the blood vein this year. We'll contact the band, we'll arrange for a traditional meal 
and then we'll donate a um, certain amount of money. All our clients will donate something to, like last time we went down was the baseball, the kids' baseball fund. So it's really symbolic and it just shows our respect for their land and uh, and they're they're tickled pink when you you know when you make that that little bit that tiny little sacrifice of your time and energy. So symbolic, it's a symbolic respect. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, we like, we'll take tobacco. We'll take tobacco, and in, in with all my books, I always make reference to you know approach these sites with respect and leave an offering. And uh, I remember one canoe group talking. Well, we we forgot to bring our tobacco, so we put Tabasco at the site as an offering. So it you know it's it's again it's symbolic, and I could have, I could ramble on about other stories when I've I seen other groups not respect these sites and terrible things happen. Sorry, sorry. I don't want to say the kind you smoke. <laughs> Doesn't matter what whatever kind. It's again it's 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 symbolic really. And often we'll donate you know packages. It's usually like pipe tobacco in the in the pouches. It's it's you know rather than cigarettes. <laughs> or vapor, vape, that we with vape. I know nothing about that. Yes, ma'am. Are we finding any particular exercise to pressure? We found some specific ways to encourage our governments to be more in the day. Yeah, we're working on that strategy. Um, it's tough because they create the the, the environment climate within the province. And uh, I, I, that was, I, I know I was on CBC this morning, I was trying to explain the fact that we have a huge um, urban population that are far removed from, from nature or the interest in nature. And, and it's growing with the immigrants, you know, coming into the country and who don't necessarily know enough about um, the environment on a broader issue. They'll know maybe about, they'll hear about the Toronto Green Belt or what have you, you know, but not in a wider sense. And this is something that, and, and really that's, and that's why Doug Ford got elected because he appealed to that, the person living in the core where all the population is in the province. So what we're doing, our environment group, Earthroots, then you know, co I co-founded that with several other uh, passionate people back in 19, 1986 it was the Tomogamy Wilderness Society. It's now Earthroots. Um, Gordon Miller, who was the, uh, um, he was the environment commissioner for Ontario for many years. He's on our board. He's, and my wife, my beautiful wife here is the, what's your title? <laughs> Vice chair. That's right. Yeah, she's the voice of sensibility, you know, with a bunch of men on it. No, we do have two other ladies on our board, so it's a pretty balanced board. So we've got a campaign um, starting, uh, I think, Tuesday to uh, um, just educate people about what's gone, what's gone on with the environment in this province since this government took hold. And it's, and it's tragic because it's set the environment movement back at least three decades. And, and like I said, we're shackled. We can't, conservation groups, um, the whole environmental uh, assessment act is, is in shambles. It's a joke. It's a, it's a political ministry that controlled by the Ministry of Natural Resources. Ministry of Natural Resources, um, having worked with them for many years and having to deal with them for many years are negligent. They are not, they don't have the expertise, the training and the knowledge to deal with non-timber, non-extractive base industry uh, issues. They are a licensing agency, period. And, and we need to understand that. It's not that we're trying to shut industry down. We just need better management and we need more parks. That's, and that's one of, the, one of the huge things that is a bone of contention with a lot of, um, a lot of outdoor people is that we're, it's getting crammed in the park system. Yes, in the back. So just to that point, Well, there's 
Yeah, um, in the province, there was, we put together along with uh, a cooperative a group of uh, environmental agencies, a list of places that need protection that are basically crown land now. They don't have protection. One of in one for for instance is in Tomogamy, where I mentioned there's donut holes that were left within the park system that should be obviously should be protected because of the uh, sensitivity of the uh, the old growth forest. Um, Wolf Lake is another one in the province. There are areas up in um, all up through Dryden, Kenora, it's 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 strangled within what's called a what's the uh, um, it's the the green what is it the the green belt um, it's it's a it's a deal between the MNR and the local lodge owners and it restricts anybody from outside the province from paddling in an area <clears throat> without um, using the services of a of an, of an operator, of an existing operator. So this needs to be changed. Some of the uh, um, re regulations and rulings outside of the park systems, that's just north of, of Quetico, for example. Um, <clears throat> Northern Ontario, uh, further north, the boreal areas, uh, a lot of the river systems are still unprotected um, areas. North Woodland Caribou, for example, is a much, that park is too small. Again, like Tomogamy, uh, it encroaches um, uh, on the woodland caribou, on the 2,000 or so caribou that are left. Uh, and they whittle that park down because of the logging interest, and they're cutting right to the edge of that park. So it's, it's, it has, a, has an effect on the, uh, the ecology. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of areas. You could probably go online and find out exactly that list um, that was presented to the government. Um, I'm not sure of the website, but you probably if you go to CPAWS, for example, Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, uh, it's probably a good chance you'll find that list. Yes, sir. Uh, do you understand the strategy behind the, the fee structure that this government is applying? <laughs> yeah, we're, everybody's trying to figure that out. <laughs> Well, it's funny in Tomogamy. Tomogamy is one of the more expensive parks, one, one of two uh, parks at exorbitant rate. And it's not fair to, to a couple or a single paddler. Um, and interestingly, there's no maintenance. Anyway, the park ranger or the superintendent went down with, with a crew two years ago to quickly put in half a dozen biffies at some of the campsites, which were just so terribly established um, with no holes. So, you know, why bother? So that so that was to that was to um, establish a criteria for for raising the price of paddling, you know, for using that park system because it had an amenity. It had six unusable unusable. Yeah, well, a lot of people are going to Crown Land because they can't afford it. You know, this this kind of recreation should be affordable to everybody, not just people who can afford. I mean, it's, it, it's expensive for a family to go paddling in a park system. You can go to a lot of the, a lot of the state parks um, and I think it's like $9 a day for, you know, for a group, it's a straight fee. I can't remember what the price is, but it's, it's fair to everybody. Um, so yeah, the, it, this is something that, that needs, certainly needs to be addressed. Everybody's flock, uh, flocking into Crown Land, so there's no there's, there's no maintenance on Crown Land. So you know, and, and a lot of people don't have the skills. They don't have they don't have the same ethics, um, or and it's a lot of times it's just simply because they haven't been educated on on how to properly camp in, in on Crown Land. That's a problem. It's it's a huge problem. We don't like Ontario was so far behind other countries, other provinces even, in establishing trails, establishing park systems. We have eleven percent protected land in this province. That's, that's pitiful, pitiful. Most of our park system is is gobbled up in in uh, uh, polar bear uh, polar bear provincial park. How many people have been to polar bear provincial park? You've been. All right, one person out of how many people here? My point is it's the large, you know, I think it's the largest part, provincial park, and, and that eats up most of that 11%. So you, you can see, I mean, it, 
it, it's all a political game. We don't want to take, you know, they don't want to take land away from, from extraction-based industry. So like I say, it boils down to the power and the quote, I'm going to go back here where it, said, where it says, um, here. a river is more than an, an amenity, it is a treasure. It offers a necessity of life that must be rationed among those who have power over it. Who has power over it? Ministry of Natural Resources. They, they wield great power. Power over um, the Ministry of the Environment, um, what they say, the, you know, uh, it, it's really hard to change the mindset and, or to sensitize uh, bureaucrats and, pol and politicians. So the only way we're going to make change, the only way we're going to make headway as far as it's conservation, more conservation land, as the need grows, is to change the, the, the temperature of the government. Yes? Uh, do you have any sense of what rivers the province is talking about banning? Uh, the government has come out with a statement that this will allow for part of the ongoing or perceived huge need coming that they are looking at banning rivers from the project. Uh, I'm not up on that. I can't tell you. Probably easy to find out, though. Um, I don't think it's really serious because I think they would be afraid to. Right now, there's a pretty strong environment movement in the province that might object to that. One of the, one of the problems too that that climate change changes a lot of things. Climate change, uh, national debt. Um, how are our how is the, our governments, how are provincial governments and, the, and you know, our federal government going to pay off the debt? One of the fears from environment groups is that, that they're going to allow more industrial um, uh, plans for um, the more remote areas, open up areas that were um, maybe proposed at one time. I know um, years ago, when I was working with the ministry, when during the environmental movement, when more parks were being formed in the province, the mining and prospecting industry got really nervous. So they bumped up all the low potential sites to medium potential sites because that just being a, a medium potential site kind of put a kibosh onto any kind of protected space. So Wolf Lake is a prime example. Flag, Flag Mining Company has been there for, for a long time. They've desecrated a lot of that beautiful area. They found nothing of value in there, yet the government still supports them. It, it's a, it's sad. It's like I say, they don't they don't. The government is not trained or educated um, to deal with non timber issues. Sorry. Yeah, but that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Often I've come, you know, how many prospecting sites have just, they just leave the site. They don't clean them up. I can show you a picture, disgrace, just, just disgraceful issue, the, the, the pictures of prospecting sites just left. Uh, garbage spewed everywhere. And drilling sites across this country, thousands of them. They don't clean them up. Yeah. That's okay. You're not you're done. Honorable... You're done with me. <laughs> no, not yet. You just step over here for a moment, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I've had the uh, pleasure of being asked to thank Cap, but before I do that, I know there are a number of people here that have canoed uh, to Mogami. I know Jake Bates and I have flown into Lady Evelyn. Uh, Bob and Marie Knapp got me hooked on Tomogamy and Maple Mountain, and over the last. Uh, Oh, 20 years of my retirement, I've been able to uh, canoe to Mogami with the uh, Gray Highlands Environmental Program. We have stayed at your cabin on the South Channel. One highlight of Tomogamy for me is trout fishing, um, where uh, Hap's cabin is. Uh, Sorry, Hap and Andrea's cabin. Oh, oh well, yes. <laughs> and uh, you, your falls, it's called Cabin Falls, but it's also known as Twin Falls. 
Uh, no, Twin Falls is the fall down from there. Okay, and there's Bridal Falls. That's the same, yeah, Bridal Falls, Twin Falls. Yeah. Yeah, and I chuckled when you talked about the uh, names because South Channel is a very tough uh, river to paddle, whether you're coming up or down. Uh, some of the highlights for me is the Fat Man's Portage, Fat Man's Falls, and you know, with a guy with a belly. I'm fortunately to have um, the high school students help me uh, when you have 18 year old boys and young ladies, they can carry the equipment and the canoe, but it is very challenging. Um, what we do with the young people in the past, we've said to them uh, in levels of canoeing, you start locally with the Saugy and the Beaver River, move to Massasauga, then Algonquin Park, then you take the next step to Killarney, but the ultimate is Tomogamy. And I'm glad you mentioned that Tomogamy is a special place. The old growth forest, some of you will have seen the pictures over the years, the three sisters. The three sisters are part of that old growth forest and it's beautiful on Ababaka Lake. You've talked about a number of things. The, the thing that impressed me today, in, uh, because I'm a canoeist and there are many canoeists here, is the quality of the maps, the portages. You've talked about the safety and not using just a top map, but there are many excellent guidebooks now and maps of, from you. I, I know this map. If you uh, buy some books, they get the Tomogamy book as well as the cabin, and you'll learn a, a little more about HAP. So HAP, on behalf of the One Sound Field Naturalist, I'd like to thank you for your inspiration. I know you ended on the political note, and that is very, very important. And you've mentioned that we have a right to exercise our vote in June. So perhaps when we have our debates, our candidates meetings, you bring the questions about parks, the safety of parks, the fees of parks. Jake and I have refused to pay sometimes and we've argued with the ministry. Why would we pay money when there's nothing being done in that park? And so those are things you can do. Individuals, individuals have the right and you can make an impact. So on behalf of the naturalists, here you go, young fella. <laughs> Thank you all, and have a great summer. Any other questions? We're going to be at the book table for a while.